Are you ready to perform at your highest potential? Thank you for joining this GP Strategies webinar, where we'll explore best practices and innovative insights to help you and your organization improve performance. So hello and welcome to today's discussion with our wonderful presenter, Leah Clark. Um, hope, hopefully um, this is a great time for you to sit and listen to our webinar. If like most of you, we are having some severe snow and cold here uh, in the United States. So again, my name is Kim Heyer. I'm with GP Strategies and I'm really happy. I'm gonna be your host for today's session. And before I introduce you to our presenter, I do wanna just cover a couple of items before we jump in. And uh, first of all, the link the recording will be provided in a follow-up email after the session today, early next week at the latest. Um, and it will provide you with a link and also the copy of the slides. And again, even though everyone's lines are muted, if you've been to a GP Strategies webinar before, you know we love to have an, a, an engaging webinar. So we wanna make this time together as interactive and possible. So if you have comments during the presentation, use the chat feature to interact with the presenter and also other attendees. If you don't have access, there is always the Q&A feature as well as the uh, reaction emojis. I also do wanna say, if you do have any specific questions for Leah, if you could use the Q&A feature, that would be great because it'll allow us to monitor them and make sure that we get them answered either during the presentation or um, at the end, time permitting. Okay, again, thank you all for joining us on our session today, and I'm really excited to introduce you to our presenter, uh, Leah Clark. Leah is a thought leader, author, and founder of Leader Connect. She's also an, a loved extended member of our GP Strategies team. She researches, writes, speaks on the topic of leadership, and has written several articles and research reports, including pieces on authentic leadership communication, leading during uncertainty, leadership mindsets, and the impact of introversion and mindfulness on innovation. Like I said, we have a really jam-packed great session planned for everyone today. And with that, Leah, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks so much, Kim. Appreciate it. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're dialing in from. Uh, I see that Joan and I are both having snowy weather on the East Coast. I'm going to guess, Erwin, you're in Los Angeles. You're probably not experiencing the same weather that we are. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure, Peter, I see you dialing in from the UK. Not sure what it's like for you. But as Kim mentioned, um, we're so happy that you're here with us today. Uh, we're trying something a little new doing, during, doing the webinars on Friday, uh, right around lunchtime or late morning for some of us. So if you are experiencing that snowy weather or not, take a moment. Uh, hopefully you've grabbed a cup of coffee, a glass of water, and uh, you're ready to spend some time with us talking about meeting with impact trends shaping leadership dynamics in 2024. All right, and Peter's saying very cloudy, but no snow at the moment. Thanks for that. Keep an eye on the chat. I love to um, interact with you as we go through the session. So if you have some thoughts or th something to share along the way, please go ahead and use that. As Kim mentioned, I am a member, an extended member of the GP Strategies leadership team. And we're going to be covering the topic of leadership today. I want to move into current and future trends but first, I want to set a little bit of context, uh, give you a backdrop that I think informs a lot of the trends that we're going to talk about. And then we'll spend some time in the latter part of the hour that we have together talking about the implications of these trends on how leaders show up in their organizations and with the people and the teams that they lead and, and what it means to be a people leader today, because I think it's changing the definition the demands, what employees need from their leaders is going through uh, a bit of a, of a significant, I would say, transition. But first, the, the backdrop. You know, we head into 2024, we're in 2024, with a great deal of uncertainty. I, I probably don't need to tell many of you or any of you this, right? Political unrest in, in many different forms, locally, globally, uh, global issues, wars, variant spikes, uh, economics, especially in the U.S., you know, we're saying it's a really big TBD at this point. Certainly better economic performance than projected, still fears of a recession, 
inflation somewhat reined in. I think I, I heard the expression steady as she goes as the way of describing it right now. Um, unemployment rates below 4%, job rates slowing, still many open jobs in certain industries, recession delayed, recession mild. Um, and then I'll, I'll add to that the cultural issues uh, and, and different generations bringing different perspectives on what it means to have career success, how they view their job, um, and decidedly different from the way some leaders in the past have viewed what success looks like for them and how they define job and organizational success, causing a bit of this tension. Uh, the world continues to change, it continues to be uncertain, and there's a lot we don't know about. So in the spirit of that, in the spirit of things we don't know about or things that we want to know more about, I'd like to ask you a question. Now I'm gonna ask you not to look this up, so without cheating, uh, put in the chat, what do you think was the most searched term in Wikipedia in 2023? Please go ahead and put that in the chat. I'm gonna give it a couple of seconds so I can start to see your guesses. AI, change management, okay. The most searched term in Wikipedia, Sarah and Craig and Stefan and Beth, um, Cheryl saying the great resignation, a lot of guesses for AI, Jonah saying chatbot, all right, AI is super fast to type. Maybe that's part of the allure, uh, or maybe you're just really, really tuned in to uh, to the answer, right? And perhaps you're one of those searchers. Um, but given its massive surge in popularity, the page about uh, OpenAI's chatbot was the most viewed page on Wikipedia with 49.4 million page views. And ChatGPT set a record for the fastest growing user base in January of last year, 100 million active users. So if you said AI or chatbot, um, certainly you were in the zone. And we know that a lot of tech companies, maybe you're, you're part of them, are pouring billions of dollars into generative AI technology. Now, I want to ask you uh, a similar question, maybe the, the flip side of things, again, without looking it up, without going to chat GPT uh, or elsewhere, what was Merriam Webster's 2023 word of the year? Oh, Ryan's putting Taylor Swift in there. I, I love that that was the, uh, the prior answer, I think. Okay, so Vanessa is saying uh, Riz. I, uh, I'm, I appreciate that contribution. I'll share a little bit about that. Debbie saying transformation. So what was Merriam Webster's word of the year? And Debbie, that's a that's a pretty good guess. I think transformation is rolling off the tongues of, uh, of many individuals, especially uh, those of us who work in the kinds of organizations that we're a part of. Pedro is saying, Pedro is saying Barbie, excuse me. Richard is saying balance. Uh, Kenny, I love that you said artificial. Okay, I am going to... Uh, take away the suspense. Riz was very high up there. I will let you know that. I believe on the Wikipedia search term. So for those of you who don't know, Riz is a certain sense of uh, charisma. And I'm not as good as I pretend to be. My children taught me that. And now it is part of the, the language of our household. I'm just a little bit ashamed to admit that. Um, but the word of the year for Merriam-Webster was authenticity. So first you have to filter out all of the wordle terms and once you pull those out, the word that uh, people sought was to find out more about was authenticity. Other words, if you were wondering, coronation, dystopian, EGOT, and implode were other words under consideration. And, you know, so what is this about? Authenticity. People searching for authenticity in themselves, right? and wanting it in the people that they work with and that they live with, wanting people to be real. And, and that actually, be real, is, is a good example for those of you who don't know. Be real is a social media platform that invites individuals to capture what's going on in the moment authentically for them to show up on social media, not in a way that's posed or staged or filtered, um, but, but to be real and to share who you are and who you're with in that particular moment. So this idea of, of being real, being authentic, telling your authentic story. Um, author Emily Olson wrote a, a really brief article in NPR on this topic, on this word, number one word in uh, from Merriam-Webster in 2023. And I was amused by some of the thing that, 
things that she called out and and that I would say set a little bit of a cultural or social context for this word rising to the the pop of the of the list, the top of the list. You can think about be real or as some of you uh, put in the chat, Barbie, right? Uh, Barbie, a story that was incredibly popular in 2023, the movie at least, with that underlying message of people wanting to be who they truly are, right? And show up as their authentic selves, not what others expect or think of you. Um, others have even pointed to Elon Musk. I'm not a fan, but certainly he shows up in a way that is consistent with uh, with who he says he is. And for those of you, you know, somebody put Taylor in the chat. You probably didn't think Taylor Swift was going to come up in a leadership webinar, um, but some have even pointed to uh, Travis and Taylor, a very authentic, supposedly love story. They're out there with who they are, sharing with the world uh, what that's all about. So if you're a fellow Swifty, go ahead and identify yourselves in the chat. I promise that's probably the last mention of her. But I would also say even some of the things that we're seeing around academic integrity and that question around, well, who wrote this and whose voice is this and who do we attribute? this to. I knew I'd get a Swifty in the chat. Thanks for that. Um, so I think, though, this is a really interesting message uh, in these two cultural data points that I'd like to tug on uh, these threads as we go through the discussion around leadership development, because I think it sets up a paradox or a tension that represents a tension that employees are feeling at home, at work, with their organizations and with their leaders. This tension between what's machine generated, tech enabled, digitally driven and unknown and a strong desire to be known, right? To be authentic and share one story truthfully and to look for authenticity in the interactions that we have with others. So I think this tug between authentic and artificial, it's showing up in, whoops, Fast on my clicking here. It's showing up, I think, in this tenuous, to use my words, or unsettled relationship between CHROs who are grappling with, and many of you may find yourselves in this situation, um, are grappling with a couple of things. First of all, the continued debate about hybrid. I would say it quietly rages on. Um, and this data from Gartner, only 26% of organizations report that their employees fully comply with on-site attendance requirements. 75% then uh, are not complying. So refusing to come to work, but maybe not refusing to do the work. And I think that's where some of the tension comes in. Uh, a continued sense of burnout and fatigue. 50% of employees view their current performance as unsustainable. And according to Microsoft, 50% of managers are saying that they're burnt out. Uh, those managers who are asking to lead with empathy, but to do so with escalating demands and fewer resources and perhaps lack of recognition for their contributions. So, so I think an untenable situation. This data point, as somebody who is really vested in leadership development, was maybe the most disturbing of the data points, but I think this is a, a result of this tenuous situation, mutual mistrust. Only about 50% of employees trust their organization. Um, I, th I think there is this teeter-totter of sort of power and control going back and forth, and not all of it attributable to hybrid, but I do think that there has been a bit of a shift in the messaging from, we care about you, we trust you can get it done regardless of location, to, okay, we, actually we need you in the office and this is where the best work gets done. So this back and forth, this tenuous situation, this tug between uh, what is artificial, what is authentic, I think that this is uh, something that we're seeing in the relationship between employees and leaders. And I think it's impacting the way leaders need to reshape, reframe, or think a little bit differently about their role. Now let's look at the numbers. These again, I wouldn't say they are uh, absolute in terms of supporting one story or the other. I think there's a mixed bag in here. This tenuous situation again, I would say is, is evident in the back and forth of the numbers. 
but a 3.8 turnover rate in the U.S., 3.8% last year. I think actually in November, it was a little bit lower than that, 3.2. This is, again, according to Forbes and some of the data from uh, the uh, Labor of Bureau and the U.S. Government Labor of Bureau and Statistics. 3.2% uh, turnover rate, two-thirds of that is from quitting, and the other third is from layoffs and firing. So that massive rush of layoffs or, or departures in late 22 and early 23, that sort of burst of separation, it appears to have slowed just a little bit. And again, according to data from the U.S. government, many industries have open positions that they're trying to fill. Now, we know from the data that we do, and you can look at SHRM data or, or really many other industry sources, that when people leave, it is definitely compensation is part of it. Moreover, they leave for growth opportunities, career advancement, the desire to, to learn and grow and advance their skills, and then also a desire for greater workplace flexibility. And I see uh, Kenny asking a little bit more about looking deeper into the numbers from a generational aspect. Absolutely. And there are uh, many reports that do that. I can offer you a little bit of that breakdown as we look at another data point, average tenure. So the average tenure of an employee in 2023, 4.1 years. And then to answer your question about generational differences, workers aged 55 to 64 had an average tenure of 9.9 .9 years and workers 25 to 34, it was 2.8 years. So we're going to go a little bit deeper into the generational differences and how that's impacting the way uh, current leaders, up and coming leaders, employees view the role of work. And, uh, and the job in their lives. We'll talk a little bit about how that's shifting. And I think that is changing the way leaders need to think about their role. And then uh, these numbers from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and Work Institute, 38% of employees quit their job in the first year. And I'm just going to move my chat here so I can see a little bit as you chime in. Um, and, you know, again, we all know the data around uh, onboarding and the cost associated with the onboarding. So the that high number here, I think, is concerning. When they did leave, the, these employees that quit within the first year, what they cited was often the expectations of what the job was going to be, particularly as it related to advancement and the growth potential that they saw wasn't there, uh, as well as a difference in the level of flexibility that they thought they would achieve when they joined the organization. So I think that certainly there is this context of uncertainty, this shifting power differential in the relationship between employees, leaders, and organizations, um, and these factors that I've already alluded to, but I want to dig into deeper, that are impacting uh, what it means to be a leader today. And I want to talk about how they're impacting leadership, but on the back end, share some thoughts about, okay, be this as it may, what then do leaders need to do? What how can they show up differently with their people? Um, and I think as we explore each of these and as leaders think about how they need to show up differently with their people, it is going to give us the opportunity to move from this tenuous and mistrustful kind of place to one in which we, you know, I would hope sort of simultaneously appreciate each other's differences, differences in how we look at work, differences in where and how we work. Um, so appreciate each other's differences while still sharing a mutual interest to do well by doing good for ourselves in our role in our job and doing well for the organization. So let's unpack each of these just a little bit more and talk about the implications for leaders. So first of all, generational influences. Now, your reaction might be, I don't want to see this, right? Haven't these things always been there? Boomers, Gen X, why are we talking about this right now? Um, and, and I think you're right in that each generation of leaders um, is influenced by the generations that, can, that go before them. Uh, those leaders who created a bl blueprint for leadership that was... Um, often modified, but largely followed, right? So I do think that this is a dynamic that has been there. Prior generations create the blueprint, the new generation comes in, sort of modifies the blueprint, but but follow it, follows it. 
What I think is different here is the sheer number of millennials and Gen Zs that will make up the workforce. You can see here 63.8% by 2025, 74.7 by 2030. And even though there are some questions about like, well, these numbers seem a little high and regardless of whether they are even back down a little bit from this in, in certain other sources, the numbers are large, right? The, the sheer number of millennials and Gen Zs in the organization and their influence. So the sheer numbers for sure, I think are a big reason why we're talking about this. And then and let me just click here so you can see the bullets. Um, what I think about this generation that alters, again, the contract, the dynamic between uh, some of the employees and their leaders is that this is a group that is very, very tech savvy. So a generation that isn't seeking to learn technology, they've grown up with it, right? So they're a generation who has always known a cell phone and the internet and cable uh, TV, right? And it's just hardwired into the way that they connect with their friends, the way they manage their lives, um, even the way they invest or manage their finances. It, it transcends social media and is really just, uh, again, a congenital trait, a big part of how these generations operate in, in the world. And you can look at some of the Nielsen data that breaks down how different generations access technology, specifically millennials and Gen Zs and what they what they use it for. It's also a, uh, a, a, a generation and I do think this extends beyond millennials and Gen Zs across the board. Uh, individuals much more comfortable with a side hustle, the gig economy, doing something entrepreneurial. And these issues are not separate. There are, there are connections. Technology is one of the things that has enabled that. Um, and I think I'll, I'll offer the third one before I talk a little bit about the impact. Um, this is a group that also has a different definition of career success, right? So employees who are comfortable embracing the gig economy, doing something different than perhaps their parents or their leaders did. Um, and again, de defining career success differently. Defining it in a way that they work to live. They don't live to work. Um, and this desire for fulfillment and purpose has always been there. We've seen it in our career research time after time. And I think that uh, the, the pandemic created even more of a wake-up call around what it means to be successful, how to follow your, I'll say, North Star with respect to what development and satisfaction looks like to you. And it is changing. It is no longer that singular ladder. The definition of career success isn't just about going through one silo, a small group of individuals who can climb up to reach that. It really is multidirectional and multifaceted. So you might have come up in this discipline. You might want to jump into something else. You can bring those skills with you in a way that I don't think there was as much of an appetite for in the past. So what does this all mean in terms of that tenuous nature and that teeter-totter between leader and employee? Well, I think that it has caused um, employees to feel a lot more powerful, if you will. I think it alters the power differential between them and their leaders um, and causes them to say, you know, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to try something else. Or I don't agree with your definition of career success. Um, and I feel a lot more empowered to say, this is the way I want to run my job and, and my life. Okay. Trend number two, I've planted some Easter eggs throughout the upfront, and we're going to pull this throughout the discussion today. It's probably no surprise to you that the uh, the factor or trend number two, I've already touched upon it a little bit, is the hybrid or distributed workforce. And this is a tug that's been here for a couple of years, and, and it will continue to be. It's not, it's not going anywhere, and I'd refer to it as a complex and ongoing puzzle. And it is impacting leaders and the, the dynamics between them and their employees, maybe not in every organization, but in many. Um, and it's, it's all over the map, you know, in, in, and you can chart this, right? You can look at 2021 
go home, everyone's safe. You can, you know, get it done from home. And then in 2022, it's like, oh, we want you back in the office. You're not comfortable. Oh, okay, that's fine, right? We don't want anybody else to resign. And then in 2023, a little bit firmer, like, no, we are an in-office environment. I, I think the truth is it's still a bit all over the map. Um, so the question of where in the office, work from home, flexibility or both, when, two to three days a week, what's the sweet spot? And, and is it your sweet spot or my sweet spot? Who gets to decide? A little bit back to that that when and what the sweet spot is, the employer mandates? And, and who is, is it a policy? Is it a suggestion? What are the implications if you don't come in? I think there's still a lot of sort of muddiness here. Um, the employer mandates employees comply sometimes, sometimes. Uh, and then I think the the how do you do it? Dedicated space, keeping teams connected, you know, and, and most of all, for me, what's most important is the why, because I think some employees are calling out their leaders and their organizations on the why. Why is it that this is a, a must do and why are we mandating it? And what I've found is that organizations um, really dig into their own perspective, meaning those organizations who are in office say we are more collaborative, we are more productive when we're in the office, and they're really vested in that point of view. And then those who really have adopted a flexible first mandate say, hey, we figured it out better and we have diversity, we can hire from anywhere. The bottom line is it is a complex and ongoing puzzle. And I think there's a lot of tension for many organizations around this issue. It's a trend that isn't going anywhere or an issue that's not going anywhere. And you can see there on the left-hand side. I just pulled this image from social media, um, going into the office once a week for the culture. And then here is the culture, right? A, a row of empty cubes. And it's, I don't think it's the case, as some have said, that, well, you know, other generations or groups of employees, regardless of generation, they're not willing to do what we ask. You know, we're asking them to come in the office and there's resistance. And this is just a simple, very sort of personal comment that someone made to me, but it, I thought it nicely just encapsulated some of the tension, right? There was this willingness. I moved so I could commute into the city. I'm, I'm from New Jersey. So when we refer to the city, it automatically means New York. Um, but we, you know, I, I could commute into the city, which was the requirement for my new job. I spend three hours every day commuting. And when I get into the office, no one was there. And so there's this skepticism behind why are you so vested? Is it because you really do see the productivity gains. Maybe you do. Maybe there's evidence in your organization that it is so much better or you're getting that sentiment from an analysis that you've done of your teams. Is that your definition of success as a leader? Did you derive your career based on FaceTime and now you're anchoring to that definition and that's what you want everybody else to do? Is it a mandate? Do you, do you see that collaboration getting better? I even saw one, I would say a lot darker perspective on this in an op-ed I read not that long ago, where the opinion was, well, organizations are, are forcing back to work so they can um, so they can lay people off. It's sort of a, a, a selection process, if you will, people who won't come in. I like to um, not believe that organizations are, are, are wired in that way, um, but certainly my point is that there's a lot of speculation about this, and it continues to be a complex and ongoing puzzle. Okay. Um, yeah, I know Manuel is is having the reaction that I that I was and and Manuel just to be clear it was we're going to um prompt the back to the office and enforce it and those who choose not to come back sort of naturally take care of the reduction in force that maybe we needed again. It was only one perspective but I think it shows the range and sometimes the skepticism behind the why of the hybrid and remote environment. <laughs> um okay, sorry, I'm just I'm just uh, laughing at some of the chat comments. Keep them coming. They keep me amused but also uh, I love that you're engaged in the in the discussion here. Okay, trend number 3. No surprise, given what we've talked about already and the dynamic that I set up between artificiality and digital and tech enabled and connection. Um, you know, for artificial intelligence, I'll just share with you what I'm hearing from the organizations that I speak with. There is, I would, I would characterize it as certainty with no clarity. So we are certain that artificial intelligence is going to reshape our industry, our organization, the way that our leaders show up. 
but there's no clarity when when you probe a little bit um, and I'm not criticizing it, I think it's the reality right now that there's still a lack of um, awareness or knowledge deeper knowledge for how AI is going to impact organizations and it's it's a moving target so really hard to figure it out because it's it's changing every day so I'm finding certainty with no clarity. Uh, and this is, according to the World Economic Forum, I wanted to make sure I got my source there for you, 75% of organizations expect to adopt AI technology in the next five years, 50% anticipate it will lead to job growth, 25% say job losses. Um, I would say there's a there's fear factor right now, and the reaction that organizations are having is out of more out of fear. We need to monitor, we need to create policy. And yes, it's likely the truth that you will need to do that. What I'd like to suggest, and this will feed into my suggestions for you know where leaders maybe want to shift their thinking, to shift the narrative to how to harness, right? How to harness of artificial intelligence, um, not to be so scared of it that you sort of like, I know it's coming and it's over there and I'm not going to deal with it, but to say, you know, how can we harness the power of it and the power of our people to get the best out of what we want and need uh, in our organization? And, and I think the presence of artificial intelligence is changing, will continue to change what we need our leaders for. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. Okay, DEI metamorphosis. I'm keeping an eye on the clock here. So, a survey by Glassdoor found that 67% of job seekers consider a company's diversity and inclusion policy when deciding where to work. So, employees represent diverse populations who value diversity. Um, and you can see my sources here Tallow and Revelio Labs, they do some great work on uh, DEI related statistics. So, DEI. Uh, uh, D, E, and I are nearly unanimously important for 99% uh, for Gen Z workers. 67% of job seekers consider a company's diversity and inclusion policy when deciding where to work. And I would say that D, E, and I is in metamorphosis. There are questions about whether or not prior efforts have worked. Some organizations are, I would say, backing away from their commitment. They got resistance from earlier training that was deemed uh, too offensive. There is less support maybe than there was a few years ago. Some DE&I uh, diversity officer positions rather have been eliminated. And I thought this was really interesting that, and again, I believe that these stats are from Revelio Labs, that the attrition rate for DE&I &E roles was 33% at the end of 2022, and I just want to grab for you in my notes here, for non-DE&I roles, it was 21%. So uh, certainly a, a big difference there. And that uh, Black employees represent 3.8 of chief diversity officers overall. And those who have vacated the role point to the challenge of authority and no budget. So they said that they were essentially feeling sort of handcuffed that there was not a follow through on the commitment. There wasn't support from those above them. So I think, whoops, went a little bit too far here. I think the um, metamorphosis is around pushing beyond single learning events and a uh, commitment that is window dressing and looking at the policies and the systems in addition to ongoing or continuous learning so that equity uh, and inclusion become the norm. I think it's an end also proposition. There's a lot more to say on this. This is a, an important topic in its own right. More than one slide can do justice. But I think the, the message here is you know, that backing away that some are doing around DE and I, I don't think that's the right call. I think that, again, um, <clears throat> employees represent diverse populations who value diversity. And then the last trend before I go into the implications for leaders, and again, these are all connected. They are not uh, dis discrete. Our world is not that simple, right? They're complicated and, and intertwined and adjacent issues. But I think the other challenge for leaders, the other factor for leaders is the importance of the need to upskill and reskill. So and this, again, relates very much to artificial intelligence. Um, the Organization for Economic Cooperation 
and development predicts that technology will transform 1.1 billion jobs over the next decade. AI, machine learning will be behind many of those changes, as will um, certainly green technology. And business leaders are going to face widening skill gaps if they aren't looking at upskilling and reskilling. Now, what I will say is, um, and you can see here, artificial intelligence, employees working independently, those new roles, right? 85% of jobs that will exist in 2030 haven't been invented yet. All the forces behind why I think this is so important for leaders to focus on. So upskilling, you know, fancy term for learning and growth and development, if you ask me, but important, really important, because we know that learners or uh, employees crave, old habits die hard when I referenced learners, but we know that employees crave learning. They want to grow and develop. We know that when they are growing and develop, developing for an organization, uh, they're more engaged, they perform better, it sends the message to them that their organization cares about them, right? And there is that, I'll anchor back to that feeling of authenticity that you are uh, as vested in me as, as I am vested in delivering for the organization. It also builds that talent pipeline. We looked at some of those departure rates, especially for those first year employees. So making sure that you are investing in the career career growth of your employees, giving them learning opportunities. And when you do that, it increases their satisfaction and it improves their skills. So what do we mean by reskilling? Again, these are terms that get tossed around. And sometimes I don't know that we always stop to define them. When we talk about reskilling, this is about uh, redeploying roles, especially those that may be obsolete because of technology or artificial intelligence, and redeploying those individuals and those skills in another way. So if artificial intelligence might potentially eliminate, let's say, uh, more of a receptionist type of role, maybe that individual has really good people skills. I would hope that they do. And you can retrain that person, redeploy their skills, reskill them so that maybe they could take on a customer service role. So I think leaders, it's already a, a very big task and job that they have, but I would say upskilling and reskilling is part of what I would be thinking about given the context of everything that I shared. So implications for leaders, right? We want them to be tech savvy, human connectors, tension smoothers, fear calmers, wellness advocates, and upskill experts. It's it's a tall order to be, to be sure. It is a tall order. And I think it takes a, a holistic approach. So let's break it down. Leaders need to shift how they think, um, their mindset, their, I would say, self-awareness and awareness of others. They need to connect with their people, right? And, and that authenticity that we talked about, how can you make sure you're showing up for your people in authentic ways? They need to lend a hand to help their people in a way that is different from how I think they've had to help them in the past. And you're gonna hear me use this expression as we move through, I'll just say it right now. I think it's more coaching and less bossing. So we'll, we'll talk about that. And then last but not least, you know, forgive me just a little bit here for going here, but I do think burnout, fatigue, uncertainty, um, you know, combating that requires something that transcends I would say the other three components and soul was really the best way or the word that I could think of to describe it. So let me in the in the time we have left unpack each of these and share what I mean. So how do leaders need to think different? I think they need to audit their thinking. First and foremost, you know, fundamentally get smarter about AI technology. You don't have to be an expert, but maybe clear out some of those cobwebs and that murkiness and start to understand the implications for your industry, your company, your organization, and your teams. I would say um, increase your focus on cognitive skills. I'm really big on this one. So as I start to look at, or as I, as I continue to look at leadership development, I think that cognitive skills are going to be something that we wanna focus on with our leaders against the backdrop of artificial intelligence. And if you look at the World Economic Forum, they list top skills, um, strategic thinking, critical thinking, creative thinking. That's what I mean by cognitive skills. So a leader's ability to look at situations differently, short-term and long-term, the pieces and the whole part. Um, the need to be able to consume data, 
the data that you get from artificial intelligence uh, that you need as a leader to be able to look at with a critical eye. Where do you see patterns and trends yourself? Where does the data seem to validate what you know or raise something that might be questionable or might be worth looking at? Leaders will need to have those strong cognitive skills, um, strong skills of emotional intelligence to use their judgment, uh, to make decisions and to lead uh, based on, I would say, enhanced cognitive skills. Reframe thinking about career. I've said this a couple of times. Acknowledge that the definition of career growth is different for everyone. And the teams of people that you lead don't necessarily want to follow the old blueprint or your blueprint. So put, uh, put your judgment of what they define as growth and what they define as career aside in favor of comp compassion and conversation. Continue to push, evolve, test, and tinker with hybrid work. There is no magic answer here, but I do think that as folks are even some days of the week working in a hybrid environment uh, and they're making decisions independently, they're getting answers in other places, maybe even artificial intelligence. The implication for you as a leader, I'll go back to what I said a slide ago, is not that they don't need you, but they need you differently. They need your cognitive skills. They need you to coach more and boss a little bit less. And then, you know, I'm going to say audit your thinking with respect to DE and I, not to say, well, others are backing away from it. And so, you know, I'm going to back away from it too. Instead, to say, how can I continue to look at DE and I as a strategic imperative? How am I creating an environment of psychological safety within my team? Um, and demonstrating that I understand that this is more than a single training event. It's much bigger and broader than that and be part of the solution in your organization to uh, committing to, to something bigger. Heart, how can leaders you know, lead with their heart? Connect first, right? We talked about authenticity and that I think that craving for authenticity. So start with yourself. Be authentic about your own values, your needs, your stressors. I think this requires leaders to be self-reflective. That might seem like a throwaway statement. It's not. Often when I work with leaders in coaching or leadership development, and we offer the opportunity to be self-reflective and to say, why is it that you do the work that you do? And are you motivated in showing up with energy? Um, they find that, oh, I've never really thought about that. I've never really taken the time to self-reflect. And I think that that's it's important. It seems simple, but it's also really critical. Continue to find ways to relate with your employees. Regroup on core concepts like trust. Again, I think when the pandemic hit, we did a really good job of saying, you matter. I care about you. And that retreat from that message is something that folks are calling out. And so rather than monitor attendance, um, can you redouble your efforts on hiring and building relationships with people based on trust and mutual accountability? Understand the drivers of wellness. Go beyond the pizza parties and address some of the underlying issues of burnout and fatigue, lack of resources, potentially unrealistic deadlines. And one of the data points that I think has been really significant recently is an understanding of the connection between burnout and fatigue, right? The opposite side of the coin of wellness and employees' feelings that they are underappreciated and underrecognized. So I do think that there, and sometimes unclear expectations, I do think that there will be a lift in um, some of those, uh, an improvement, meaning a decline in the burnout and fatigue if we're able to pay attention to some of these ways of connection, ways in which we, again, certainly uh, recognize and appreciate the, the, the good, strong talent that I believe is working in many of our organizations. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and I'm just keeping an eye on the chat. I, you all have, a couple of you have jumped in with some really great comments that I wish I could just do a little check next to it, but I wanted to pause as I glanced up. I saw Mark making a comment about 
Start with trusting fully instead of waiting for employees to demonstrate they are deserving of trust. Mark, absolutely. Um, I I once did a webinar on this same topic and I said, you got to flip the script, right? Flip the script. It's not a matter of, you know, can you trust them, but are you demonstrating that you're trustworthy and are you leading uh, with, by example? Um, so so love, love that comment. Thanks for that. Okay. So what can a, a leader do in terms of reaching their hand? I sort of look at this as how can you provide support. Um, <clears throat> providing, well, first of all, prioritizing work loads, yours and your employees, you should be really clear on expectations. It's another reason why remote workers and other employees can sometimes start to feel fatigue. I'm not really sure what the goals are. I maybe need some help prioritizing my workload. Um, I would say part of this is also providing um, feedback to others and also asking them for feedback, thinking, you know, going first, if you will. So prioritize workload, keep that conversation open. What is your employee working on? How is it going? Giving them feedback, but also going first in terms of self-awareness and feedback about your own ability to show up for your people in the way they need you. Um, factor AI into the perform into the performance equation, or at least start to think about it, right? At least open your mind to the fact that there's another pair of hands in this equation, and maybe it is something that somebody can search on on Chat GPT. And instead of that fear factor, how can you leverage uh, those hands of support, or begin to think about factoring that into the performance equation? Here's again where I'll say that doesn't mean that the need for leadership is gone, but instead of being an answer giver, um, you know, or or a boss, you become more of a coach. You ask the questions. You help your employees find their own path to success, uh, whether that's an innovative idea or a different way of approaching a challenge or a solution that they may have. Again, understand the difference between reskilling and upskilling, and the relationship between that and. Uh, satisfaction, performance, commitment, and a feeling that your employees uh, understand that they're valued. Elevate your ability to coach. I talked a little bit about that. And then enable career pathing in non-traditional ways. What I mean by that is, remember that ladder that I said that I think is not really a good metaphor anymore for career pathing? You know, you can hop into different disciplines and bring your skills with you. Remember, um, employee, uh, employees are looking at their definition of career success very, very differently. I think, um, you know, it's it's working to live, not living to work. Um, and it's defining success in a way that is somewhat inconsistent with some of the folks who are in leadership positions right now. So I think you need to uh, enable career pathing in non-traditional ways, maybe less about networking and more about connecting people through ERGs or other communities, through volunteer efforts, um, enable those connections. And again, not those siloed, very narrow ladder-like ways, but thinking broadly about multi-directional opportunities to help people uh, grow and develop. And then I think, last but not least, as we come into the last bit of this discussion, I think employees are looking for more from their leaders. I, I do. And I don't mean in terms of productivity. I think if you have the role of the leader, you know, how can you become a presence, a positive factor in the work lives of your employees and not just someone with whom they have a weekly one on one? So I think it's something that transcends how you give an answer or lend a pair of hands. And it's more about how you think differently about the connection that you forge with your people. Um, but you're not going to do that. You're not going to be able to cultivate that spark in others if you don't know what's inspiring to you. So sharing that driving force behind your action on your words, as I said a moment ago, reflecting on what motivates you and understanding what motivates your team um, and tapping into those, I'll say, micro moments of acknowledgement and inspiration. Um, share some stories that underscore key messages and inspire your team and share your authentic voice with them uh, in a way that is, again, uh, authentic and, and realistic. So as we round out the last bit here, uh, I thought I'd start a little bit where I began with looking at things that are happening around us, words that we're looking up, uh, visual reminders of what it means to be a leader or what it means to be successful. Because I think that the old definition of 
a leader and leadership success, it's being dismantled. And if you're not convinced, look around, right? You can look at these indicators or these markers, the corner office, right? Everyone aspired to it, the stuff that dreams were made of. And now a successful leader executive continues to get it done from home, sometimes with their furry cat walking across the screen or their child in the background. Um, the boardroom, the executive conference room where decisions were made, the power source in an organization. The power source now, well, it's probably wherever you can plug your computer in. Um, networking, the golf course, you know, where deals got made and where people were able to, you know, rub elbows and network. You know, I like to think that some of these trappings are being dismantled as the, the world of work and the definition of success changes. Now we network online and in ERGs and we encourage employees to create communities based on uh, a mutual benefit, not just about sidling up to someone for power. And then finally, how do we define success? What's the definition of importance? Once defined by many, by how busy we are, how much we travel. And, and if we're being honest, sometimes by how little we take care of ourselves. I don't have time to go to the gym. I didn't have time for lunch. Mental wellness wasn't something that we talked about. That's not the definition of success and importance that many employees, many of the employees leaders lead are aspiring to. It's, it's a different time now and employees don't aspire to that stereotype. We define success a little bit more based on how well um, folks take care of themselves and how mindful they are. So these cultural indicators of success, I'm looking at them more as cultural artifacts. And I think if the rest of what we've talked about today doesn't convince you that it's changing, it's shifting, you know, start to look at some of these things around you. And I think in those indicators, you can see that the, the shift or the change is real. So what it means to be a leader today and in the future, it's about certainly embracing that uncertainty and embracing that technology not anchoring to past paradigms, not forcing success, uh, your definition of success on a generation of brilliant tech savvy employees uh, who look at the world and the world of work differently. Not less than, but, but different, right? And I think leading teams is going to look more like what you see on the screen here, technology, artificial intelligence, and human beings. Generations who define professional success differently by their standards, not yours. Um, and individuals for whom diversity is a must have, not an add on. And I think leaders, those who will be successful, are those who are going to embrace it, who are going to think differently about the way that work gets done, recognize the importance of connection, help their teams perform, um, and demonstrate in both word and action that their teams can get it done, not just for their organization, but also for each other. So artificial intelligence and technology, yes, absolutely, can be scary, it can be unknown, but I think we need to get to know it a little bit more and embrace it as part of the leadership equation and harness it, don't just police it. And it probably comes as no surprise to you that I wanna land on and authenticity, connection showing up as who you are as a leader and a human being and inviting the same of the people that you work with. Because I think that that is more than just a trend or a factor. I, I think that is great leadership. So I really appreciate the comments in the chat. I've been keeping an eye on them. I know that we are getting to the top of the hour, uh, but Kim, I'm not sure if any questions came up and and if anyone would like to chime in, I'm happy to answer anything that might have uh, perked up. Okay, so there is a question here that in the, the that came in through the Q and A, and I'm gonna um I don't know if you can see it or if you want me to read it. It's it's about um, dealing with moving to new teams and areas when they're already settled in their processes and trying to get them, I guess, to move to the new team, that they make comments and indicate they're not comfortable with so many modifications, I guess. How yeah, do you so deal with that? Yeah, so how can we deal with moving to new teams and areas? Uh, they're settled in their process, a bit outdated, mm -hmm. um, and they're not comfortable with too many modifications. Yeah, so I mean, I would say certainly one of the things that I would do is I, I think you have to make some space for that emotion, that feeling of uncertainty um, and understand and recognize in an empathetic way, in an emotionally intelligent way, what's going on for those groups, right? And, and what is it that they are 
fearful or uncertain of. So I think pushing somebody to a change uh, without an acknowledgement of that emotion will only cause them to be more resistant. So I think a best practice would be, again, um, as a leader, being aware of that emotion, giving them the opportunity to surface it, acknowledging it before you move them to maybe the more practical, tactical or logistical components of what sounds like a change that is going to have to happen. Um, mm -hmm. But I think acknowledging the emotion and the uncertainty is is a surefire way to, or not acknowledging it is a surefire way to only get more resistance. I would say also, it's not clear to me in this comment if some of it is a reluctance or an uncertainty about um, new processes and embracing technology. It seems like there might be a thread of that in, in Kenny, what you're asking about. I also think there's an opportunity to employ some reverse mentoring. So if there are individuals on your team who are maybe more tech savvy or more aware of these processes, creating a, a reverse mentoring scenario where maybe some of the folks who are um, tuned in to the new can help to bring those who might have a wealth of experience but a lack of comfort with new technology or new processes uh, into the fold. Thanks, Leah. Um, I see another question here about, can you speak more about the non-traditional pathways and what that might look like when we have such narrow job descriptions? Yeah, I mean, I think that this is something that's going to be different based on the industry and the role, right? So I'm not certainly suggesting that somebody who has been in marketing, which I was for uh, some years, many, many years ago, could suddenly say, oh, I'm gonna become a surgeon, right? I don't I don't want that person operating on me. You probably don't as well. So there are some uh, roles, some industries that clearly that sort of movement into um, another path isn't going to be realistic. But I think there's what I'm suggesting is there should be an openness within reason, depending on the industry, that again, maybe somebody who has been in, um, I'll give you a real example of someone I'm coaching. She is, uh, she graduated from an engineering school and right now is in an organization, an engineering organization. She really wants to do something that has to do with marketing and website and production of a brand that she feels a connection to. Well, there's a greater appetite right now to say, you know what? Your engineering background, that's not a liability. We want the way that your brain thinks um, and the way that you approach problems to show up in the marketing role that we have posted. So I think non-traditional pathways, what I mean again is the ability to find transferable skills and an increasing openness to once an engineer, not always an engineer, because if you are, um, if you have the right, again, I'll say cognitive skills, if you are um, a good employee, meaning committed and wanting to learn and grow and do more, why can't you move into a decidedly different uh, opportunity? And then I'll just add, that's a sort of very specific example, but I would also say non-traditional in that Growth and development doesn't always have to mean movement up in terms of level and compensation. Can you take on a stretch assignment? Is there a volunteer effort that will give you the opportunity to test some new skills? Um, you know, are you okay with encouraging that employee to, to satisfy some other aspect of where they want to learn and what they love to do in a, in a side hustle or something that they do in a way that's entrepreneurial? So when I talk about non-traditional pathways, I talk about a greater openness to moving between disciplines, depending on the industry and the role. And I also mean that in terms of development and new opportunities being uh, something other than a uh, hierarchical movement up into an increased level or increased compensation. Now, the, the downside of this, and I know I'm giving you more than you asked for anonymous attendee, um, but the, the downside of that is you have to be a little bit careful because there's been a lot of conversation too about dry promotions, which are you know, oh, you you gave me more responsibility and maybe you even gave me a level change, but you didn't give me increased compensation and that didn't feel right to me. And so I think you have to balance that, um, it, you know, by sort of recognizing what's important to your employee, make sure you're going about it the right way. What is the right way? 
you're going to find that out through conversation. So making sure that you're keeping that conversation about career and growth and development um, open and two way with the individuals that you are leading and mentoring. Thanks, Leah. Actually, I know we're almost at the top of the hour. We have a couple more questions, but I just, there were a couple of questions I just want to target for those that may have to jump right now. And that is, how can I share this session? And am I going to get the recording to the slides? So I just want to say, yes, how you can share it. When I send you the email, you're going to get a link to the slides and the recording, and you can share them through your social networks that way. So we do have two more questions. If you want to take them, Leah, um, yeah. So I see the question about um, single learning events, window dressing, more sub substantive learning. Uh, what does that look like for you? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's what I said. I'll go back to the continuous learning. And my comment there is I do think a couple of years ago, there was a lot of like, let's check box, push out, um, you know, definitions around DE and I terms. And let's and, and I'm not saying that that's not important, but I don't think that work is ever done. I think it's continuously sort of questioning how you're showing up in the world and with your people, questioning your assumptions. Um, and so that's what I mean by that. I mean, I think that there should always be some aspect of reflection and feedback, self-awareness, um, you know, psychological safety that creates an environment where uh, diversity and inclusion can thrive. And so I think it's learning and also looking at policies, looking at processes, all of that together to um, to really move the needle on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the other thing I want to mention, which I, I realized I failed to mention when I was on that slide, one of the other things that is shifting or growing louder around DE&I is the, um, the desire to measure, to measure efforts and to measure uh, results and improvement uh, and, and to, to make a case through numbers for the importance and the investment in diversity, equity, inclusion. So that's another thing that I would sort of add to that mix or that potpourri of things that make DE&I a little bit more substantial. And I'm really happy you asked that question because it gave me the opportunity to remind myself of the, the data and analytical part. Um, did you see the question from uh, Lisa in the chat on um, transferable not. skills? I it says, I find not. that less experienced employees often have what I perceive to be unrealistic views of what they can take on. Should we just take a leap of faith on those employees based on their transferable skills or their eagerness to advance? Yeah, I mean, again, I would go back to, and, and thanks for the question, I would go back to, um, you know, we call them career conversations for a reason, because they should be conversations two way. And the leader, you know, the employee absolutely should express what they're interested in, where they want to learn and grow, um, what it is that they want out of their current role and where they want to go next. But it's not just a matter of, well, they want that. And so therefore it's your responsibility to match them up. You as a leader also need to provide them with some feedback. Maybe the way that they're perceived in the organization suggests that, you know, they don't have strong organizational skills. And so moving into a project management role without making some changes or working on that isn't going to happen. Um, maybe right now the organization doesn't have openings where that person wants to move. So I, I, it's not just you know, glibly, I want to go to this other place. And so, the, you know, okay, leader, make the match for me. It is an ongoing conversation and it's incumbent upon the leader to also provide uh, their perspective and to share with the employee, you know, what, what the perception is, where there may be some gaps in those perceptions, where there might be potential gaps in what the organization can offer. Um, and maybe not to say never, but to be candid about, uh, what maybe that person needs to do to get there. It, it might not be a, an immediate match. Great. So thank you, uh, Leah. Thank you for your pre great presentation today. Even based on the feedback in the chat, it was amazing. I appreciate your time. It was a great discussion and a big thank you to everyone for your time and attention as well.
Um, at the end of the session, I do ask you to take a minute to fill out a survey. Um, you make us better with your feedback. And we hope you'll join us again for another one of our upcoming webinars. Visit GP Strategies website to view any of our future sessions coming up. And I wish everyone on the call a wonderful and productive rest of your day and a great weekend. This webinar was brought to you by GP Strategies. Together, we help organizations transform through their people. You can access more webinars or download additional resources by visiting the GP Strategies Resource Library. The link is on your screen and in the description.